Gil. Thank you, choir, for leading us this morning in the worship of our Lord and our Savior. And thank you, ushers, and thank you, deacons, for serving us this morning as we take up our offerings and our collections. And thank you for being here. Um, you could have been anywhere else today. You could be doing lots of different things. You could be home in the bed, but you're not. You're, you're here. And you're here because the Lord's been at work in your life. And, I, and we, we appreciate that. I appreciate that. The church is appreciative of you being here and listening and, and willing to learn from the Lord this morning, not just in this service, but in the groups that will be meeting and the conversations that you'll have. You know, I love that we use the word, word, because oftentimes that's really all we need. We just need a word or a couple of words that encourage, encourage us. And so I pray this morning that at some point this, this morning through this service or through the songs or through the conversations that you will meet the Lord and He'll give you that word that you need. Um, I'm thankful to be here, and I'm thankful for the sermon that we have. I'm thankful for the, our, our word that we do have for us. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to jump right on in this morning. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a little preview of what we're going to do. We're going to look at this passage of Scripture, scripture Matthew 28, often referred to as the Great Commission. And we're, we're not really going to talk about it from the terms of the Great Commission, but we need to look at what undergirds this command. And there's some fundamental, there is a fundamental truth, and there is a fundamental decision, and there is a fundamental promise that's in this passage that then undergirds what we call the Great Commission. So I'm just going to go straight forward. We're going to jump right into the truth and the passage that's there. And then once we do that, then we're going to step back and look at some examples of people who uh, tried to answer the questions that we're going to see today. Um, to get us started, you know, uh, have you ever tried to do something without getting the main thing taken care of beforehand? Uh, oftentimes, we've got to take care of the main thing, right? The main thing's got to be what we do first. You can't bake a cake without any kind of eggs, right? That would be a problem. That's not a good thing. You can't drive a car without gas. Uh, if you go to the airport to fly, you better make sure you have your tickets. There are the main things you've got to have in order to move forward. And what we're looking at today is a fundamental truth and a fundamental promise that demands that a fundamental choice that for the, to live out the Christian life, there's, this is the main thing. It is fundamental. You cannot live the Christian life without this truth. It's fundamental to the Great Commission. It's fundamental to the Christian life. And in fact, it's fundamental to each and every person, not just the believer, but to every person on the planet. So what is this important thing that we need to look at? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 28. Um, Matthew chapter 28, we're going to start reading in verse 11. Now up to this point, Jesus has been uh, ministering for three years. He's, he's been arrested, he's been put on trial, he's been persecuted, he's been murdered. But it's been three days later and Jesus has arisen and he's appeared to Mary to Magdalene and he's appeared to the women and he's appeared to the disciples if we put all the Gospels together. And we get to verse 11 and we begin to see Jesus is preparing them to give them a direction for where they need to go next. We're starting in Matthew chapter 28 verse 11 if you'll read with me. Now while they were going, meaning the ladies... And behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had been happening. And when they assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. Who, these are the soldiers who had been at the tomb, saying, Tell the people that his disciples came at night and stole away, stole him away, stole his body away while, while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make sure you are safe. And so the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, instructed. And this saying commonly is reported among the Jews until this day. So then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him. And yet some still doubted. And Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And know I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
There's one fundamental truth that Jesus puts out as he's preparing his disciples to what's fixing to come over the next little bit of time. And he puts out this fundamental truth that says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority, Jesus says, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is a significant truth that has immense impact on our lives. Jesus says, I have authority. If we look at that word, it means that Jesus has power. He has dominion. He has influence. He has the right and the ability to rule. That's what authority means. He has influence, the power to change situations and change people's hearts. We know that the Lord has the ability to convict and influence situations. If you're struggling in a relationship, one of the greatest things, whether it's a work relationship or a relationship with a spouse or a family member, one of the greatest things we can do is pray because we can trust that the Lord, His job is to work in the hearts of people. He has power to influence and change people and situations. He also has that right in that position. Jesus, by His authority, has been positioned at the right hand of God. He has position to have authority over his creation, over this world. He also has rule and jurisdiction. From a legal standpoint, he is judge, jury, witness. He is all things. He is defense attorney. If the saying is true, that it's not what you know, but who you know, Jesus is the guy you want to know. He is the guy who has authority. But Jesus said, I have authority. He says, I have all authority. This is not just partial authority that that, that exists just for us who believe. No, we'll see in just a minute that Jesus has all authority over believers and unbelievers. And not just for some time, not for just a certain period of time. Jesus has all authority over all time. Hebrews 13 says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. His authority is over all time. And not just in some locations, not just here in this church within these walls, but outside these walls, in every home in this community, every home in our city, and in our state, in our nation, in the world, Jesus says, I have all authority. All places, all time, all circumstances, all people. Jesus is saying, Jesus is making this claim that he has all authority. Jesus says he has all authority. Jesus made ridiculous claims from the people who heard him and listened to him. He said things like, I had glory with God before the foundation of the world. He says, if you want to know God, you got to come through me. And in this moment, Jesus is making another claim that if we look at it and break it down, that it's an amazing claim. He says, I have all authority on earth. Flip back with me a couple of pages, or flip forward just a couple of pages to Mark chapter 2. And we're going to see how Jesus has authority in, on earth and in heaven. He does have this right, this power, this legal position. And he has it in all time, in all places, in all locations. And he says, I have it on earth and I have it in heaven. So I look at Mark chapter 2. I'm sorry, skip over Mark chapter 4. I'm sorry. Mark chapter 4. At the end and starting in verse 35, we see that there are the disciples have gone and they've gotten on a boat, right? And they're going out on the storm and Jesus is there with them. And this storm comes up. And this storm, they, they would come up quickly in this area and Jesus is asleep. And they're scared and they're afraid. And they come down and they say, Jesus, wake up. Don't you even care what's happening? But in verse 39, it says that Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be still, be peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And Jesus said, Why are you so fearful? Why, how is it that you have no faith? And their fear and their awe was exceedingly great. And they said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus says, I have authority on earth. The next chapter over, chapter 5, we see that Jesus has a man named Jairus come up to him and say, Will you come, please heal my daughter? And on his way to to go see the daughter, he gets stopped by this woman who touches him. And she's had this flow of blood for 12 years. And it stops. And she's healed. 
Just by touching his robe, Jesus says, I have authority on earth over not just the wind and the waves, but disease. And we know all throughout the scriptures, the people that were blind and deaf and had diseases, and he cured them. Jesus has all authority on earth, but Jesus also has authority in heaven. In Mark chapter 5, look with me. In verse 16 and 17, this is the story of the man who was demon-possessed. And he was the man who would live in the tombs and he would cut himself. And people were afraid because this was a wild man. He was a crazy man. And Jesus shows up, and has, speaks to the man and casts out all the demons. And you know the story. The demons go into the pigs and there's like 2,000 pigs and they run down the hill and off the cliff. And man, it was a mess. If you were a pig farmer that day, that was a bad day. And so they saw this. The people who were there who owned the pigs saw this. Saw the authority of Jesus. And the man who was demon-possessed experienced the authority of Jesus. As Jesus said, I have authority over heaven. I'm going to cast out the demons. And he did. And I love in verse 17, it says that they, the people who had the pigs, began to plead with Jesus to depart from the region. And yet, and and as he got into the boat, the man who was demon-possessed begged him that he might stay with him. So track with me here. Jesus says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. I have all authority over diseases, over the weather. I have all authority over spiritual things that we can't see. And we see, we get our first glimpse of how people begin to respond to this authority. The people who owned the pigs said, they were afraid and said, please, whatever you do, Jesus, with you and your authority, you need to get out of here. They were afraid and they were pushed back when they saw his authority. And yet the man who was possessed, what did he do? He, sur- he surrendered to that authority. He begged Jesus, said, Jesus, Let me come with you. Flip back over one more page to chapter 2. Because Jesus does have all authority in heaven. The last thing that Jesus, we're going to talk about today, that he has authority over. In chapter 2, verse 9. This is the story of when they... Jesus was preaching in a home and there was a paralyzed man and he had these four friends who cut the hole in the roof and they dropped him down. And Jesus said, saw his friends and saw the faith of his friends and saw the faith of this man to trust in his friends. And so he said, he didn't just heal him. He said, your sins are forgiven. And the Jewish people who were there said, who is this guy who says he can forgive sins? Only God can do that. And in verse 9, Jesus says, what is it easier to say that your sins are forgiven, or to take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man, here's the word, has the power, has the authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, take up your bed and walk. And immediately he took up his bed and went, to the, went out from the presence of all of these people, and they were all amazed, and they glorified God and said, we have never seen anything like this. Jesus has authority in heaven, which means Jesus has authority over sin. Jesus says, so that we may know that he has the authority. He is the one who's been positioned and placed and given power to be judge judge over sin. He's the one that's been given that. And this is a critical point when we come to our Christian faith and we come to our Christian life that each and every one of us, we recognize that there's there's sin that's within us. We recognize that there's something that's not right in me when when my heart, when I want to do the right thing, but I also want to do the wrong thing. And there's that sin that's limited and there's something has to be done about that. And we can look at every religion in the world and we can look at every worldview that exists in the world and none of them deal with personal sin. There is only one And that is Jesus Christ, who's ever claimed to deal with our sin. Because he stands up and says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. And so that's why we come to him. That's why we take that simple step of faith to say, Jesus, I trust in you. And why is Jesus the one we have to trust in? 
You know, this is, this is the, the thing that made, it, made the truth for me come real. Was, was I was struggling with Christianity and struggling with who Jesus was. That I read this verse one time that said in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. There has to be blood shed. Way back in Genesis, we see this idea with Adam and Eve that when they sinned, that God killed an animal. He made tunics of skin to cover them up. And he set in motion this pattern that something had to die in order to pay the payment for sin. And one day, Jesus comes along and says, I am the Lamb of God, who is the sacrifice to pay the penalty, to shed my blood for the sins of the world. And so now when I stand before God, I stand before God with my sin, and I deserve to die for my sin. But Jesus is the one who steps in my place and says, No, Father, you do not have to punish Michael because I've shed my blood for Michael's sins. Therefore, Michael can live. Jesus paid that penalty. That is why he has all authority in heaven and earth because he paid that sacrifice. He gave his perfect blood, shed his blood for the forgiveness of my sin and your sin and for the sin of everyone in this community, in the state, and in this world. Jesus is the one and that's why he has authority. My hope is in him in his power and I live this day trusting that Jesus' death pays the price for my sins. And that Jesus was the one who repaired my relationship with God. So Jesus lays out this fundamental truth. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now what do we do with that fundamental truth? What do we do with this claim that Jesus is making that he has ultimate authority? Well, each and every one of us have to answer that question. And we live in a world where we struggle with authority. I've had conversations with people, even in the past month, and they'll say things like, I struggle with authority. I don't like authority. And if I struggle with authority, then I'm going to struggle with Jesus. In our culture, we see where we struggle with authority. We see back in the 60s and in the 70s when we had government corruption and how that's continued. We have, tr we have trouble sometimes trusting in our government. We have uh, moral uh, authority that we've questioned all throughout the last decades as we see things in our country as culture changes from a morality standpoint. M moral authority is being questioned. We see authority questioned in our culture. So we have to answer the question, what do we do? Well, that fundamental truth demands a fundamental response. And that is surrender. We surrender to his authority. And that's where we come back to Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew 28. Now we see this as the Great Commission because God is calling them to go out. But if we re-look at this from the perspective of surrender, what is Jesus asking them to do? In Matthew 28, 18, All authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded them. This surrender, or, or these commands, Jesus, is, there's implied surrender that has to happen. Be baptized. Be baptized. I have to be surrender. I have to surrender myself to publicly say, one, I trust in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I identify myself with Jesus, and I'm going to publicly come and be baptized. That is an act of surrender for me as a person. I surrender myself to his teaching and to observe and do the things that Jesus has taught. Jesus is commanding me. He's, he's inviting me to say, be surrendered to my teaching. Teachings like, don't worry. Serve others, love my neighbor, find rest in me. Simple teachings of Jesus that, guess what? The, his authority calls me to be surrendered to his commands. He also gives me the command to go. Therefore, I have to surrender myself and say, you know what? I'm going to get outside these things that make me comfortable. I may be around people that I'm not comfortable with in situations where I'm not comfortable with, even doing things I'm not comfortable with. But I recognize that God is calling me to surrender. I'm surrendering to his authority as I am baptized, as I trust in him, as I follow his teaching, as I go to places and people that may not be in my norm. 
And as I surrender to his plan, that is always about people. God's plan is people, not programs. He will always use people first and foremost. And I surrender to that. So I see that the proper response, I see that the, the best response to this authority is that I be surrendered to that. And the reason we go here is because it leads us then to a fundamental promise. That if I accept and recognize his authority, and I do this one fundamental uh, choice in that I surrender to him, then I get to a fundamental promise where Jesus says, I am with you. I am with you. And out of this fundamental truth, Jesus, and fundamental promise, you can know without a shadow of doubt, that the Lord and Creator of the universe and everything around you, that and in His sovereignty holds the world together, was with you when you woke up this morning. That He's with you as you go through your day. That He's with you when you get the news about the death of that loved one. He's with you when you hear the news of that health problem. Or He's with you when you're struggling in that relationship with a spouse or with a child or with someone at work. The Creator and Maker of all things, Jesus says, I have all authority and I am with you. And there's two benefits that come out of this. One is security. Security. If I know that Jesus has all authority, then I can have security. And here's the analogy, guys. I have three kids, uh, 15, 13, and 11, and they're teenagers. I guess I made it to teenage years. I made it out of the preschool years. I made it out of the, the, the kid stage. But I tell you what, I learned something about them as preschoolers and as kids that I see even today. That when, when, when my kids know that mom and dad are in charge, and when they know that mom and dad have a plan, and we, we know what's going on, and we know what direction we're going, say this happens a lot when we're on vacation, the kids will start asking us questions. Well, where are we going, and how are we going to get there, and what are we going to eat? They have all of these questions because they're insecure, and they don't know what to expect. And when mom and dad can say, well, here's, here's what we're going to do, and here's where we're going to go, and here are the places we're going to eat, And guess what, guys? We're going to have a good time. You could just see they take a deep breath and they're like, all right, this is going to be okay. They have security because they recognize that mom and dad are in charge. For you and for I, the authority of Jesus is not something that we have to bear under. It is a place where we get to be secure. We find security for our life, for our circumstances, to know that the sovereign God is in control. We can have security... And we can also have significance when Jesus says, I am with you always. Listen to these words out of Romans chapter 8. Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What trial, what distress, what persecution, what famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, or principalities, nor powers, nor things in present, nor things to come, nor height, depth, nor any other created thing. Paul is saying there is nothing in heaven and there is nothing on earth that shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus says, I am with you and I love you. And that gives you and I significance to know that he loves us. I think there are people here this morning morning, that 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 is the word that you need to know. That God loves you and that he's with you. And there is nothing in heaven and on earth that can separate you from his love. So we can find security and significance in this fundamental truth that Jesus has authority as we make that fundamental choice to surrender to Him, we get to live on that fundamental promise, finding security and significance. Now, I want to stop right there. but We have just a few minutes, and I want to show you some quick examples of people. So, if you would, just flip back one page in Matthew chapter 27. And we'll do this real quickly. Matthew chapter 27. We see four people who encountered Jesus during his trial 
who came face to face with the authority of Jesus, and yet they chose to respond differently than what I just described. In Matthew 27, verse 3, we see that there was Judas. Judas was his betrayer, and seeing that he was condemned, and that Jesus had been condemned, he was remorseful, and he brought his 30 pieces of silver back to the chief priest and said, I have sinned and have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is this to you? What is this to us? You see to it. And it says that Judas threw down the 30 pieces of silver and he went out and he hung himself. We see in Judas that he found his security and his significance in money and in possessions. And when he felt conviction, he didn't go to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He went to the leaders and, tried to, and he asked for forgiveness from them. He was remorseful, but he wasn't repentant. He was sorry for what he did, but he wasn't repentant to Jesus. Because we see that he had his security and his significance in his money. I pray that we are not a people who find our significance and our security in our possessions, our wealth, or our affluence. That was him. If we flip over to, or if we go over to verse 24, we see Pilate. Pilate is talking to Jesus. He's being brought face to face with Jesus. If you want to read more of that, look at John chapter 19. And he's asking Jesus, who are you? Who gives you this authority? Are you a king? And Jesus says, I am. And Pilate does not want to move fast. He does not want to send Jesus back out to this crowd. But we see in verse 24 that it says, When Pilate saw that he could not prevail against the crowd, but rather that there was a rebellion rising, he says he took water and washed his hands to the multitude. He said, I am innocent of this man's blood. And he, and he passed Jesus off to the crowd. In Pilate, we see a person whose significance and their security was in their work, was in their position. Because see, Pilate was concerned. He was, he, was, he was tracking with Jesus until the rebellion came up, started to rise up. And they started saying things like, well, if you let Jesus go, you're no friend of Caesar. And that threatened his job. Pilate's security and his significance was in his position and in his work. I pray that we are not people who find our security and our significance in the things that we do. We flip over. In verse 27, we see the soldiers. How did the soldiers respond to Jesus' authority? In verse 28, it says they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him and they twisted a crown of thorns on him and they put it on his head and they put a reed in his head and they bowed their knee and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They mocked Jesus' authority. You know why? Because their significance and their security were the fact that they were Romans. They had a, they had a racial, cultural, societal position of authority over him. Or so they thought. And so their security and significance was in the power that they had. Because they were politically and culturally and racially in a position of authority. I pray that we are people who never find our security and significance in political, in societal, cultural, or racial influence. Because they did. And they rejected the authority of Jesus the last group, down on verse 39, were the Jews themselves. They passed by and they blasphemed Jesus, wagging their heads, saying, Who, He said he could destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from this cross. Verse 42, He saved others himself, but he cannot, he cannot save himself. If he is king of Israel, let him come down from the cross. And we will believe, he trusted in God, let him deliver him now. Because he said, I am the son of God. The Jewish people and the Jewish leaders rejected the authority of Jesus because they found security and significance in their traditions. Jesus came along and said, my authority went counter to what they, what they found in security and significance and what the traditions that they had, and they felt threatened. I pray that as a church and as believers that we do not find our security and our significance in our traditions, but yet we do what the thief did. You know the thief? There was one who cursed Jesus, but then there was another thief. 
He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Simple surrender. Simple recognizing of Jesus' authority. Simple surrender. Simple hope. And that is what the Lord calls us to do. Because the truth is, guys, it really doesn't, ultimately, whether we recognize Jesus' authority, He has it already. It, we can have a blue sky, and if I put on orange sunglasses and I say, hey, hey, the sky is orange today, is the sky orange? No, it's still blue. If I look up in the sky and I see a dot that looks like a little white thing, and I think that's just a little dot, and it's a galaxy, it's not a little dot, it's a galaxy. Whether or not we recognize his authority, he has that authority. And by the grace of God, he makes himself known to us to say to us, he has all authority in heaven. He gives us evidence in our life. I love Hebrews chapter 1. I mean, Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of the things we can't see. And so God, in his mercy, in his sovereignty, allows us to be able to experience that in our own life. C.S. Lewis, in writing one of his books, stole a story from John Duncan, not a story, but uh, uh, stole from John Duncan, an old Scottish preacher. And he said that Jesus was one of three things. Jesus was either a liar, he was a fraud, because he knew he was, he was making statements like this, and he knew in his heart that he was not these things. Or Jesus was a lunatic, because Jesus was making statements like this, and he believed with all his heart he was, but guess what? He wasn't. Or Jesus was Lord, and he was exactly who he said he was. The challenge for you and I today, the challenge for every person that walks on this planet, is we will come face to face with the reality that Jesus has all authority. My prayer is that you and I will find security in that authority, and that we'll find comfort and significance in His promise. And out of that, we can live the Christian life. Out of that, we can follow the Great Commission. Pray with me. Father, I thank You so much today. I thank You that You are sovereign, that You are in control. I thank you, God, that you love us so much that you promise to be with us when we surrender to you in faith, when we surrender our lives to you, you promise to be with us. And we thank you for that today, Father. I pray that for each and every person here, including myself, that I would find significance in that, to know that you love me and know that you've given us that grace. And that, Father, that we can be surrendered to your authority and to what that brings to bear on our life. Let us not be people who find security in money or wealth, or political position, or in anything of ourselves. But Father, that it would be holy in you. And Father, we trust you in this hour. We trust you in this moment. I pray that you would continue to work and move as you see fit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If we move into our time of response, Philippians chapter 2 says that to every, every knee and every, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This morning, I believe that each and every one of us have something that we need to surrender to the Lord. Some of it may be public. Some of us here may need to make a public decision that we've been wrestling with with Jesus, that, that we need to come forward and say, I publicly identify myself. That is the surrender that I need to make this morning. Some of it, some, for some of you, it may be joining this church and, and, and becoming one with this body to publicly surrender to what the Lord is, would, would want to do with you in this body. But I also think that there's a lot of private surrenders that need to happen. I think maybe there's marriages where couples need to surrender. I think there's parents that need to surrender to God's authority in the way that they want to raise their kids. I think there's work issues and decisions about our jobs where God needs us to surrender. I believe that there are even sin issues 
where God wants us to surrender to what He's doing in our life. Whatever the decision that you need to make this morning, publicly or privately, if you stand, musicians are going to come lead us. I'll be down front. I'll pray with you. Answer any questions. Accept any decision. Or maybe you need to pray where you are. I, just, I ask you, please, find your security. Find your significance in His authority and in His presence. And be surrendered. You? Sing together. Take my life.